party. Uh, the invitation arrived the day you left, so uh, I said that you'll be there. All right. It's young Brian's firstborn. You were at his wedding last year. <coughs> Should be a good day. Hugh. Yes? O'Hagan's. Oh, Don't you a foster? Tell me the name of these again. Broom. Broom, that's it. Uh, the Latin name is Genista. Uh, Virgil writes about it somewhere. Does he really? Uh, actually, that genista comes from Spain. <coughs> good Lord, does it? Spanish broom. Magnificent name, isn't it? Give them plenty of water. Magnificent colour, isn't it? A letter from the Lord Deputy. They really transform the room, Harry. Splendid idea of yours, thank you. A letter from the Lord Deputy vigorously urging you to have your eldest son attend at the newly established College of the Most Holy and Undivided Trinity in Dublin, established by Her Most Serene Highness, Queen Elizabeth. <clears throat> that vigorously urging sounds ominous, doesn't it? Sorry? Sir William Fitzwilliam would like to have you send, send you to the newly established Trinity College in Dublin. I'm told that he's having all the big Gaelic families send their children there. <clears throat> he would like an early response. This jacket, Harry, what do you think? It's not a little too excessive. Excessive? You know, a little too, too striped. Striped? All right, damn it, too bloody young. It's very becoming, Hugh. Do you think so? Maybe I should have gotten a room. A reminder that the Royal Fair Festival of Harpers takes place next month in Roscommon. They've moved the venue from Turuski. Uh, as patron of the festival, they would be most honoured if you would open Genista. the event. Of the yes. Spanish broom. Really? They need plenty of water. A bit of trouble here, I'm afraid. O'Kane of Limavadi says he can't pay the tributes until the harvest is saved. But in the meantime, he will send ten firkins of butter and twenty casks of beer. As usual, he's lying. You know, it might be an idea to bill a twenty extra gallow glass on him for the next quarter. That'll keep him in line. Um, Sir Garrett Moore would like you to come down to Bellefont Abbey next week for a spot of fishing on the Boyne. He says it's the best salmon season it ever had. Uh, the Lord Chancellor will be there, and uh, Sir Robert Gardner. You knew him when you were in England, didn't you? Who's that? Sir Robert Je Gardner, the Lord Chief Justice. Oh, that was 25 years ago. I haven't seen him since. It might be worth renewing that friendship now. Uh, just to show him I haven't reverted completely to type, would that be it? For political reasons. We'll see. Oh, have the, uh, the musicians arrived yet? Yes. And the rhymers and the acrobats? I told you, everything's ready. And you're sure nobody's had a whisper? I told them you're at the meeting of the council in Dublin. Everything's in hand. Good. A bit more trouble here. <clears throat> the Quins and the Devlins are at each other's throats again. <clears throat> the Quins raided the Devlins land three times last week, killed five women and two children, stole cattle and horses and burned every hayfield in sight. Uh, the Devlins remind you, once more they say, that they have a right to expect protection from their chieftain. And that if they cannot rely on Hugh O'Neill for their safety and justice, then under the Brehon law, then they will have to seek protection under the new English law. And they will, too. I know what I'll do, Harry. This is a squabble that needs to be sorted out quickly. I'll make the room upstairs into our bedroom. And I'll shift that consignment of Spanish saddles down to the back room. They should be closer to the stables anyway. Well, the room upstairs faces south, and there's a good view down to the river. Yeah, yeah that, that's a good decision, don't you agree? Why not? Excellent. That's a bit of bad news from London. Lord Essex has been arrested and thrown in the tower. What for? There's a list of charges. One of them is treason. No. For conferring secretly with the basest and vilest traitor that ever lived, Hugh O'Neill, in a manner most disloyal to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. He was fond of you. I was fond of him, despite everything. I know. Crazy man. Now, what else is there? Oh, yes. Hugh O'Donnell and Peter Lombard want to see you. All right. Someday next week. They're here, Hugh. What, now? Waiting outside. Oh, come on, Harry. I'm scarcely in the door. O'Donnell knows you're home. And Lombard has been here for four days already waiting for you. He's done an enormous <laughs> amount of work. That's only half of his file. All right, I'll give them ten minutes and that's all. You can only pick up 
we're done writing a history of you. Well, well, <coughs> so he told me. We have our own analyst. Well, he knows that. What sort of book? Ah, he said something about a history, I don't know. The life and times of Hugh O'Neill, I imagine. He might have told me about that. He spent all day Tuesday confirming dates with me. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure I like this idea at all. Ah, maybe I got it wrong. But ask him yourself. Now, here's something you'll have to read for yourself. It arrived a few hours ago. What's that? From you. Bagnall. Bagnall. Father or brother? The brother. Give me that. No, no, no. Read it to me. <coughs> From Sir Henry Bagnall, Queen's Marshal, Newry, <coughs> to Hugh O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone, Dungannon. It's, it's just a catalogue of accusation and personal abuse. Uh, your first marriage wasn't properly dissolved, so your second marriage was ambiguous. And now, of course, this third. Bastard! He's threatening to have, have a charge of abduction taken against you. What's he talking about? Because she's under 21. Abduction! He's threatening to come and have her taken by force. She's not exactly having a try for Christ's sake. <laughs> What's that? We got our hands on a letter that he sent to the Queen. I am ashamed and deeply humiliated that my blood, which myself and my father have so often shed for the repression of this rebellious race, should now be mingled with so treacherous a stock. My blood. Stop it, you mongrel. He's going to be troublesome, Hugh. Ignore him. He'll bluster for a few days. I'm going to see about that bedroom. I knew I heard the voice. Young O'Donnell. How are you, man? Good to see you, Hugh. You're welcome. Good to see you, too. Sure, I haven't seen you since the horse swung the clock wall the day you rode that. Jesus, lads. <laughs> and what about that? Is that not a sight for sore eyes? <laughs> Do you like it? I bet you that's a London job. No, of course. <laughs> and the smell of perfume off him. <laughs> Peter. How are you, Hugh? You're welcome back to Dungallon. Thank you. Sure, my poor sister's not seven months dead. And I bet you the bugger's in the prowl already. Am I right? Gifts for you, Hugh, from the Pope. And what's all this? A bird cage and a golden candelabra. Oh, that for craftsmanship there? Mm, lovely indeed, beautiful. He sent me a present too. Guess what I got? A papal lesson. <laughs> uh, with his warmest good wishes, I'm not being paid off. Am I? He's behind you, Sergeant. He always is, but no matter. These things take time, Hugh. I have a letter in here from you for you. Let's see about the room. So you're just back from Rome, Peter. Rome a week last Sunday. I came via Spain. I have a lot to report. Good. Will you sit here? Thank you. We've helped ourselves here, too. Yes, of course. Sorry, Peter. Not for me, thanks. Now, I have copies here for everyone. Do you know what the floor in that wall out there is going to Kiev and Madrid, but This is all for reasons correspondence with Spain. Our case to Philip II, including his last reply, which you have not seen yet. We can dry rot in the house in Bally Shannon. My mother had to tear out every piece of timber in her case. <laughs> and this, this is a resume of my commentaries. A thesis I'm doing on the Irish situation. Basically, my argument is this. Because of her mismanagement, England has forfeited the right of domination over this country. The Irish chieftains have been forced to take up arms in defence of their religion. You, by virtue of your birth, education, and personal attributes are the most likely leader of that revolt. I'll go into more detail later. Do not be mother then. She went out and got Oak off those armada racks flying around the coast and replaced every <coughs> floor and window in the house. It's a terrific job. You could gallop a horse across that floor. <laughs> you should do the same thing here, Hugh. And I hear you're writing our history to you. Ah. Harry's been talking. Have you begun? No, just checking some events and dates. And when your checking is done? I suppose I should try to arrange it into some kind of order. Eventually. And interpret what you've gathered. Not interpret you, just describe. Without comment. I shall tell the story of what I saw and took part in as accurately as I can. But you'll tell the truth. I'm no historian, you. I'm not so sure I know what the historian's function is, not to talk of his method. But you'll tell the truth. If you're asking me, will my story be as accurate as possible? Yes, I think so. But truth and falsity, I'm not so sure they are the proper criteria. I suppose when the time comes, my responsibility will be to tell the best possible narrative. After all, is not what history is itself, a kind of storytelling. Is it? Imposing a pattern on events that were often casual and haphazard, and shaping them into a narrative that is both logical 
and interesting. Yes, I think so. And where does the truth come into all of this? <laughs> I'm not so sure that truth is a primary ingredient. It's then a shocking thing to say. But I suppose when the time comes, imagination will be as important as information. But one thing I will promise you, Hugh, nothing will be written down for years and years to come. History has to be made before it's remade. That's being worked out. Good. Now, let's make this short and brisk, shall we? What's on the agenda? Hugh has information that the English are building new fortifications. You know what the horrors are at? They're going to build a line of forts right across the country, from Dundalk over to Sligo. That will cut us off from the south. The second stage is to build a huge fort at Derry, so that you and I will be cut off from one another. Then the Donegal and Tyrone are isolated. Then the plan to move in against each of us. And the Archbishop has news of help from Spain. I have noticed as well the king. But their first move is to strengthen the forts they already have. Bagnall's place at Newry, Armagh, and the Black Water. I have spent a lot of time in Madrid recently, Hugh. And I can tell you, Europe is looking more and more to us as the ideal springboard for the Counter Reformation. And another thing I want to talk about the ship O'Doherty up in the Do you know what the way gets that, Hugh? Nipping down as far as Killy Beggs, stealing our sheep, and shipping them off to France. Running a bloody big export business. But my sheep. <laughs> the initial shock of the Reformation is now over. Catholic Europe is gathering itself together for a counter Reformation, and feeling that culturally, geographically, and with some military assistance, we could be the ideal springboard for the counter attack. I mean, I go in today and snatch the bastard and chop his head off. <laughs> and if I do that all in a showman's up in arms. And already I have a work of his breath and he's threatening to quarter. <laughs> Did you hear what we did in your work last week? We got word that he was down in Clare at a funeral. So we slipped down to Loch Allen and took away every horse and fully owns 600 prime animals. Jesus, he's going mad! Because <laughs> he can't come after us. Because he's no transport. <laughs> you won't do that. Uh, let's begin with the Archbishop, shall we? Well, you'll help me against the shit of now, won't you? Because if I do nothing, the bugger will think he has me bit. Uh, you sit there. Get on it. That'd be a good poison. <laughs> the very job. Send them a peace offering. A cask of Bordeaux special. <coughs> Three months ago, you wrote again. Better still, you send them the Bordeaux special. They never suspect you. Look, I got a jar of this deadly stuff from Genoa last week. One drop in the glass. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you. Three months ago, you wrote again. All the same now, that jacket takes years off him, doesn't it now? Come on, come on. If I may, you'd never think he was 41, would you? He was 40 who? Peter? Three months ago, you wrote again to Philip II of Spain, asking for Spanish arms and money. You had the copy dated August the 3rd. I have no copy. <laughs> <laughs> the final sentence reads With such aid we hope to restore the faith of the church and to secure you a kingdom I never agreed with any of that stuff about securing him a kingdom I brought back his reply The document dated May 14 I've been informed that you're defending the Catholic cause against the English that this is acceptable to God is proved by the single victories you have earned. Not against the civil lottery. <laughs> I hope you will continue to prosper, and you need not doubt I will render you any assistance you may require. Now, after all these years, I think I have a very good idea how the Spanish court thinks. They have a natural sympathy and understanding of us because we share the one true faith and they abhor England's attempt to impose this new heretical religion upon us. But do not assume that that sympathy is unqualified. Their interest in us is both practical and political. I've had a series of meetings with the Duke of Lerma recently. Have you ever heard? He determines our foreign policy. And every time I meet him, he says the same thing to me. Spain will help you only if you are of any use to us. But when I look at you, what do I see? small island situated to the west of our enemy, England. A tiny portion of an island, the area around Dublin, under the English rule. Small pockets of old English families scattered throughout the country, but by far the greater portion of that island under Gaelic rule ruled by the Egyptians. 
constantly at war. Occasionally with the English, but always, always among themselves. And how can warring and fragmented tribes be of any use to us? Constantly at war. Jesus, I haven't the enemy in the world. <laughs> but what Lerner is really saying to us is this, you know, if we can forge ourselves into a cohesive unit, then we can go back to him and say, we're not warring, we're not fragmented, we are a united people. Now, Paris. Now, at this point, I'd like to return to my commentaries. The documents with the blue color. The full title is De Regno Hibernia Santorum in Sala Commentaries. I have no copy. My thesis is this. If we have to understand that the Irish situation fully, we must go back at least 400 years to the famous October 17th, when King Henry II of England landed here. He had in his hand a copy of Pope Henry the Pope's full Lauda Vilita, making him Dominus Hibernia. <coughs> King of Ireland. And that book had two consequences. The first was to I got married Ireland. last night. <laughs> what? <coughs> I got married last night. You're a liar. <laughs> You're a liar. But your pocket, you never did. Yes. Go on, mate. You said he was in Dublin, and I'm eating in the council. He was in Dublin. Jesus God Almighty, the bloody jacket, didn't I tell you that he was hiding? You kept that very quiet, you. Who took you, Bob, you? I know, with the big red head you had here all last month, that Scotswoman, Ali MacDonald. <coughs> no. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, Peter. I know, I know, Brian likes wine, he's honoured. The fan of what? What's her real name? Uh, Cecilia? Oh, no, not Cecilia. Who oh, then? Come on, man, tell us. Did you say last night? In fact, at two o'clock this morning, we... Eloped. We eloped! Sweet Jesus God Almighty, we eloped! <laughs> well, lay me down and bury me, this Who eloped? Congratulations, man! Tell us, who is the new countess then, you? Oh, I hope I still have the same appetite for it when I'm your age, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Neither of you knows her, she's from Newry. McGinnis? Siobhan McGinnis? No, she. The other sister then, the one with the teeth. Me of. <laughs> I met her only a few months ago on her 20th birthday. She's only 20? She's one of the new English. Her grandfather came over here from Newcastle under Lyme in Staffordshire. He was given the Cistercian Monastery and lands around. Newly in Carlingford, that's what brought them over. One night. Quit that fool of you. Tell us her real name. Her name is Mabel Bagnall. She is the daughter of the retired Queen's Marshal. She is the sister of Sir Henry Bagnall, the present Queen's Marshal. <laughs> Anybody for more wine? <laughs> <laughs> Where did you get married? The Bishop of Meath married us in John Conrad. Which Bishop of Meath? Thomas Jones, the Protestant Bishop. Mabel is a Protestant. Hold on a minute, you know. Wait a minute, wait, wait, wait! You can't marry into the upstarts! And the sister of the butcher, big now, Jesus, man! I'm going to ask her to come and join us. Keep her for a month, you. That's the very job. Keep her for a month, like you did with that McDonald woman. Nothing big for it. She won't mind you, honest to God. It's what you'll expect. And these new English are all half tramps anyway. Let's give her some clothes and a few shillings and kick her back home to Staffordshire. Her room is newly. Wherever she's from, it's all she'll expect you, I'm telling you. I'm going to ask her to come and meet you, but. I'm right, Peter! We all have to assess the religious and political implications of this association. <coughs> Marriage, Archbishop. Will Spain <coughs> think so? Will Rome? I think so! And this is my country! I have married a very spirited, a very talented, a very beautiful young woman. She has left her people to join me here. They will never forgive her for that. She is under this roof now, among a people she has been reared to believe are wild and barbarous. 
I'm having a celebration tonight when I will introduce her to my people. I particularly ask you two to welcome her here. But if that is beyond you, then I demand at least civility. The bogger's off his own head. That's all there is. She's turned the bogger's own head. Stay overnight. We'll meet again tomorrow morning. And he let me blather on about the English building new forts. And him joking around the Uri fort all this time. That's a class of treachery, Harry Hopton. That's what that is. You're talking rubbish, you. Do you know where the Buckshire vehicle was last week? In the Finn Valley, raiding and plundering with a troop of new soldiers over from Chester, the way you would blood young greyhounds. Slaughter them, they had 15 families sailing hay along the riverbank, men, women, and children. But the result that at this moment in time there are over 100 refugees in my mother's house in Donegal Town. I'll have copies made of these. I tell you something, Harry Hopton, as long as he has that upstart bitch with him, there'll be no welcome for him at her conal. At least wait and meet her, Peter. For his sake. Here we are. I'd like you to meet two of my friends. Uh, Hugh O'Donnell. Sir Hugh O'Donnell, Earl of Chicano, my wife, Mabel. I'm pleased to meet you. How you doing? You all right? <laughs> and Dr. Peter Lombard, the titular Bishop of Armagh and Primate of Orion. I'm pleased to meet you. Well, we've got to keep on the right side of Peter. He's writing our history. That seems to make you uneasy for some reason you do. Not as long as you tell the truth. You keep insisting on this word truth. Don't you believe in the truth, Archbishop? I don't believe in a given period of history, a given space of time. My life, your life, are changed within it one true interpretation waiting to be mine. But I do believe it may contain several possible narratives. The life of human beings can be told in many different ways, and those ways are determined by different needs and different views. What do they want to hear? How do they want it told? So, I'm not altogether my own man here. I simply fulfill expectations. You're looking rested now. And Harry Hogden, you know. Yes, I know Harry. Do you like the flowers? Yes, they're lovely. Uh, Broom? Yes. Uh, member of the Janista family. I wouldn't know that to you. Actually, that Spanish broom comes from Spain. They, they need plenty of water. <laughs> broom needs hardly any water at all, Hugh. I have a slug of that wine, Hugh. That's all right. <laughs> yes, of course. Sorry. An anybody else? Uh, did you have a wine? I lay down, but I didn't sleep any. The noise from those cows. I looked out of the window, and all I could see were thousands of them stretching away to the hills. We well, must have millions of them. Cows and horses, that is. We're going to put you in the room upstairs for us. It's quieter there. Please excuse me. I've got some more letters to write. The celebration begins at nine, Peter. And Hugh hasn't eaten since this morning. We'll join you later. I want you now. I'm a beach of friends, you said. Now, now. You should have warned me, Hugh. I want to devour you. I'm in pieces, so I am. Hugh O'Donnell and the Popish priest in a couple of minutes. Did you not see my hand? It was shaking. Let's go upstairs. Our Henry calls in the butcher O'Donnell. He says he strangles lambs with his bare hands. Well, that's true. Oh, God, are you serious? Yes, and he eats them raw. Oh, God, you're not serious. <laughs> yes, we all do that here. Stop it, Hugh. And he speaks so funny. Why doesn't he talk like you? Well, how do I speak? How do I speak? Like those old English knots in Dublin. Well, that's why you're a fair guy about me. And I shook the hand of a Popish priest, Hugh. <coughs> that's the first time in my life I ever even saw one of them. And I said, I'm pleased to meet you. I went to my sister Mary and about this. Yes, and your brother Henry. Oh, Henry would shoot me, Hugh. Would he? You know he would. I shook the hand of a Popish priest. Archbishop. Is that worse? Oh, much worse. <laughs> <laughs> and look at it. What? Your hand, it's turning black. Oh. <laughs> You're a real bastard, you. <laughs> this is all a bit too much. I mean, maybe I'm going to cry, and the stupid thing is that I never cry. Oh, secrecy, running away, the wedding ceremony. 
all the excitement of being here and meeting those people. I mean, they weren't very welcoming, were they? They didn't even speak to me. Give them time. Just when I was riding away from home, I turned round and there was my father at the landing window. And he smiled and waved. He had no idea I was running away. I'll never understand why I did it. Now, he is a good man and he's a fair-minded man and he will try. But it will never make sense to him. He's going to be hurt and hurt for the rest of his days. I'm all right. I'm just a little bit confused and a little bit nervous. I knew things would be different now, but I didn't expect them to be quite so foreign. I'm only 50 miles from home here, but I feel so far away from everything I know. Give me your hand. It's all right, it's not black. You're a tough breed, the upstart, you know. I have a present for you. Yes? It's a new invention. It's, it's a time piece you carry around with you. It's called a watch. A watch? <laughs> Wear it on your finger just like a ring. Where did you get that thing? I had it made for you specially in London. The only other person I know who has one is Queen Elizabeth. Oh, Hugh, it's beautiful. And Elizabeth wears it on that finger. The Queen has one, and I have the only other one. Queen Elizabeth and Countess Mabel. Why not? Why not, indeed? It really is beautiful, Hugh. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I'll never cry like that again, I promise. Never again, ever. Because we're a tough breed, the O'Neills. <laughs> you for a change. I really can't, Mabel, not this time. Anyhow, you and I always fight after a few hours. Do we? Well, sometimes. In that case, next time, maybe. Next time. That's a promise. I've left a box of quince selection in your pantry and a few jars of honey. Last week, I'm afraid. If it crystallises, just leave some more water. Thank you. They have no bees here, have they? No, we haven't. I 
finally persuaded our Henry to move his hives away from the house, thank heavens. Do you remember, just beyond the vegetable garden, my father built the fish pond. Well, that's where they are now, in a semicircle around the pond. He has over a hundred hives now. Has he? Oh, maybe more. Really? We sold about 4,000 pounds of honey last year to the army, mostly. They would buy all he could produce, but they don't always pay him. And do you remember that bog line's always been left in the pond? Oh, you wouldn't recognise that area now. We drained it and ploughed it and fenced it and planted a thousand trees in four separate areas. Apple, plum, damsel and pear. Henry had them sent over from Kent. They're doing beautifully. Good. They have no orchards here, have they? No, we haven't. Where's the vegetable growing, is it? We go into pastoral farming, not husbandry. Cattle, sheep, horses. With 200,000 head of cattle, as you've heard. <laughs> Did you say something about a herb garden? Oh, that's a great success. That little square where we used to have the seesaw. Do you remember that little patch outside the kitchen window? Mary, I'm not going to hear I've brought you some seeds. I've labelled them for you. Dill, borage, fennel, lovage. Tarragon and coriander. I had tansy too, but I'm afraid it died on me. Do you remember Eddie Easton used to make tansy pudding? Don't plant the fennel in the deal with the two across fertiliser. Is that bad? You'll end up with a seed that's either one thing or the other. Borage likes the sun, but it will survive wherever you plant it. It's very tough. I should have some valerian later on in the year, I think. So. Are you still a bad sleeper? Was Father conscious at the end? Father? Conscious? What about him? They've been personal messages for everyone. Messages? And detailed instructions about everything. <coughs> the west door of the fort needs new hinges. The last consignment of muskets of defective hammers. They depend totally on London because they really don't understand the difficult job we're doing here. Personal messages. <laughs> You've forgotten nobody. I'm to take up bookbinding if you don't mind. Our Henry spends too much time at paperwork and not enough at soldiering. Old Tom the gardener should rub beeswax into his arthritic joints. Give a new Bible to the two maids from Tangibee. Half an hour before he died, he was asking what price we were getting for our apes. Wonderful, wasn't it? Yes. I miss him terribly, Mabel. I know he had a hard life. It was a very full life. You forget that almost single-handedly he tamed the whole of County Down and County Armagh and brought order and prosperity to them. God blessed his great endeavours, and that was a great consolation to him in the end, to all of us. I miss you so much, Mabel. I wish you too. I locked your bedroom door the day you left, and it hasn't been open since. But the house seems to be getting bigger and emptier. You enjoy the garden, don't you? Henry says I should get out and we'll meet more people. Where am I supposed to go? We're surrounded by the Irish. And every day more and more of their hopples are springing up along the perimeter of our lands. You visit the free things, don't you? They left. 